Guess where it's going, people? It's going lower. The U.S. Treasury as global reserve asset, U.S. Treasury bonds, it's over. Fiat is the Ponzi, okay? You got to understand that Fiat is the Ponzi, and they don't teach you this in school, because if they did teach you that the Fiat was the Ponzi, you'd never deposit your money in a bank, a commercial bank, because you'd realize it's actually not safe. OK, the only way that that depositing money in a commercial bank is safe is because it has a Fed backstop or a central bank backstop implied. It's too big to fail. Therefore, you can lever banking 25 times its equity base. That's what a commercial bank is levered 25 times. OK, so if you learned that in school, you'd be like, holy shoot. I don't want to deposit my money in a commercial bank. It's actually not that safe. And if it is safe, the only reason it is safe is because they can have print unlimited amounts of money, which means the value of my money isn't actually that valuable because there's no scarcity to it. So you really need to understand this. OK, so you got to actually do the real math. You got to understand how the Fiat Ponzi works, which starts with commercial banks that are levered 25 to 1. And when you're levered 25 to 1, which means you can only lose 4% of your loan value before you are insolvent on your way to bankruptcy, how often do you think a loan loses more than 4% of its value, gentlemen? Trust me, it happens on a regular basis. The commercial banking system is regularly insolvent and people don't know. But it's happened. 1988, when I started my career, Latin American debt. 1998, because of uh, the long-term capital management, okay? A Nobel Prize winner who was running long-term capital management and selling insurance to the street, and they were 100 to 1 levered. It's like people didn't do any math. They were buying insurance from an insurance company that was 100 times levered to its capital base, and they thought it was fine. That's part of the Fiat Ponzi. Wall Street was rescued. Losses were socialized because nobody did the math as to the reality of long-term capital management. Because said, oh, the guy's a Nobel Prize winning professor. He must know what he's doing. No, he didn't know what he was doing. He brought Wall Street to its knees. That was the second one. The third one, the great financial crisis. Everyone was insolvent. Everyone. And the TARP Troubled Asset Relief Program, which... The Fed printed $700 billion to rescue the system. Guess what? The last and final one was COVID. They printed trillions of dollars, multiple times what they printed to rescue Wall Street in the great financial crisis. That's where we are. Learn that fiat is the Ponzi people and successive financial crises will happen more quickly. They'll happen with greater severity. And quantitative easing infinity is a 100% certainty, okay? All this bullshit that the Fed's out there, they're going to fight inflation. They've either done the math and they realize that it's nothing but job owning or they are going to bankrupt the country. One way or the other, all paths lead to Bitcoin, okay? You bankrupt the company, country, your dollar's worth nothing. You print QE infinity, your dollar's worth nothing. You need to hedge the fact that your dollar is worth nothing under all scenarios. But they'll keep printing it as long as people think that's the solution. And that is the Fiat Ponzi. You need to understand that 21 million decentralized math and code is a thing of beauty. And that is Bitcoin. It solves a lot of stuff, including intellectually challenged economists that don't even know mathematics. Michael Burry, he's a horrible risk manager, okay? Michael Burry is a horrible fucking risk manager. He might be very smart, but he should have stopped himself out of his trades way sooner than he did and then re-entered them at the right price. He just was very, very stubborn and got rewarded in the end. But that's not how you manage risk.
And that's another reason he's intellectually lazy. He doesn't understand that Bitcoin is actually the solution to the subprime mortgage crisis that he identified the first time around. So tell Michael Burry to learn some fucking mathematics and also to learn how to manage risk because he's a shit risk manager. OK, I will stand by that. He is a shitty risk manager. Here's the funny thing. The United States is so powerful. And that's why, because it has individual regions in the in the United States that are bigger than most developed economies in the world. It's un friggin believable. And by the way, you guys are fucking it right up. OK, so you can say whatever, but you guys are fucking it up because you think that you are in a privileged status that can never be taken away from you. Wrong. And I don't want that to happen. But if you don't start smartening the fuck up, you will lose global reserve currency status. Global reserve asset status of U.S. Treasuries is already gone. OK, you've seen global reserve banks, central banks take their U.S. Treasury holdings from 72 percent of reserves down to 59 percent. Guess where it's going, people? It's going lower. The U.S. Treasury as global reserve asset, U.S. Treasury bonds, it's over. What's going to replace it? My opinion, Bitcoin, if you guys get your head out of your ass. But I don't care. If you guys don't, other countries will. This You can adopt Bitcoin and treat it like your savings account and keep your checking account, which is your fiat reserve currency, functioning so that the world uses U.S. dollars for things like global trade. But as far as a savings technology, you better change because if it doesn't change into Bitcoin, it'll change into and it already is oil. Now, everyone says that gold is your reserve asset as, as a hedge. No, you know what it actually is? It's oil and natural gas. And Vlad Putin, despite all the shit that he's doing in the world, he has this figured out and he knows he can use oil and natural gas as a weapon. OK, so. What is Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin is digital energy. And what is oil and natural gas? Well, that's natural resource energy. So doesn't it make sense that wealthy nations with natural resource energy consider selling it for Bitcoin rather than U.S. dollars, especially when they freeze your reserve assets like they did on Russia? I'm not defending what Putin did. I'm just saying if you have all this money saved in U.S. treasuries and all of a sudden you can't get to them. That's not much of a reserve asset, is it? You know what it actually, the USA doesn't realize how lucky they are to be able to print US dollars because effectively, what does that mean? They're able to print oil and natural gas. Wow. No wonder you guys are so friggin' strong. You can print energy as long as energy is priced in US dollars. But as soon as it's not, you better get on board the Bitcoin train, people, or you're going to be like, you know, demoted because your resource energy is nothing like that of Saudi Arabia or uh, Russia or the, the other economic powers that have much deeper natural resource supplies than the United States has. So let's start with the reality that the uh, contagion effects and the uh, systemic risks within the crypto market uh, have knocked Bitcoin down a peg or two, no question, okay? Luna, I felt it survived the Luna debacle very well. So Do Kwon was not as smart as he thought, and his hubris guaranteed that he would get into trouble, okay? At the end of the day, it was a bad model. It was actually the digital, it was digital version of, fee, of the Fiat Ponzi. That's what Luna and Terra were, the digital version of the Fiat Ponzi. And when you have a bank run, well, that's what happens. And it was, clo you know, there was no weekend where you could close the Luna uh, uh, blockchain like they close Wall Street and then get things uh, straightened out over the weekend and have some sort of rescue. Uh, it didn't happen. There was no rescue. $60 billion of wealth evaporated, which was about the same amount that equity holders lost on Lehman Brothers. But the reality was Lehman Brothers was a debt situation. It was, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of debt that had connected counterparty risk that caused a uh, contagion on Wall Street. Luna came and went. Uh, there was no rescue. 
Uh, Bitcoin fell because there was selling to defend the peg. But TikTok, next block, nothing happened to Bitcoin except the price went down. And, you know, people got uncertain and come along the Celsius network. Again, another poorly designed DeFi protocol that should never have gotten out of the gate save for funding from stupid Canadian pension funds like the Case de Depot Plasmans Quebec that funded their Series B round. But God forbid they should own any Bitcoin, right? So these are the idiot Canadian pension managers that put money into the, uh, into the Celsius network seed capital round. Anyway, you get what you deserve. If you don't do your research, you get what you deserve, which is a bagel on the value of your seed equity. But the reality is this second punch coming in quick succession to the first punch, Luna, knocked Bitcoin down again. TikTok next block. Here's the funny thing. It's keeping working. The health of the network is identified. The DeFi protocols will all fail. Those aren't my words. Those are Nidig's words. Every single DeFi protocol that exists right now is at high degree of likelihood of failing. This is healthy for the Bitcoin network long term. Short term, you got contagion effects and systemic risks just within the so-called crypto universe. You know what? There's a trillion dollars of crypto assets in the world right now. One half of them are in shit coins. A lot of those shit coins are going to fail in the short term. Do you there will be some potential pressure on Bitcoin. Then we could talk about the economic effects of the bigger tra TradFi markets if you want. But that's the reality of the crypto